Let us read from Psalm 84. I think it's page 916 in the Church Bibles. 916, Psalm 84. It is written, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it springs. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord God will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who will walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Okay, so there's two parts to this message, really. Um, Part I'm going to record, which is going to go out there, and a part I'm going to record, which is only for our ears only. Okay. So, I found this lovely... um, I can't really see it up there. Um, When I was looking for an image to kind of describe um, what I want to talk about, I couldn't find one. I was putting in their valleys, I was putting in their kind of uh, change, uh, going through stuff, and there's lots of lovely pictures and backgrounds of things you go through. And I was putting the word transformation. And on Pixabay, which is free kind of um, pictures, this came up, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's my sermon. And it's this guy, he's walking along, and he's got two bands on his wrists, and one of them says, transform. And the other one says the valley. And I thought, my God, that's Psalm 84. Because they're passing through something. Yet there was transformation occurring. So that's what I want to talk about. So it's a brand new year. And we're setting our hearts on God. And we're walking with him. Some of you are still recovering from last year and the year before. Because you've been going through stuff. But that's okay. Church is a hospital. Church is a hospital where God mends us and heals us and recovers us and brings reconciliation and restoration where we can go out again full of joy, full of the Holy Spirit, healed that we might, our lives might have a witness to others, that we can bring other people into the kingdom. What I love about this is um, really through Psalm 84, I've seen that God wants to bring transformation in our lives but in other people's lives. So think about what's happening with the River of Life groups. Think about what's already happened up to this point. But the first point is this. It's invitation to transformation. That's what Jesus the King, thank you Jesus, is bringing us today, an invitation to his transformation. As we started the service with uh, Romans, Romans 12, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Our minds is renewed as we read the word. Our mind is renewed when we look at Jesus. Our minds is renewed when we think about good things, holy things. When our mind is governed, uh, God gives us heart. He guards our heart and our mind in peace. He brings his transformation. So in Jesus, in Jesus, we have this invitation to transformation. And God just blew my socks off. That's going to be my saying for this year. Blow my socks off. Remember that, was it, was it the extra strong mint advert in the 80s? Yeah. Yeah. Where, he took a, where he took an extra strong mint and they were so strong. He said, oh, we blew my socks off. In other words, you're so amazed at God this year. God's going to blow your socks off. Right? Some believe that's okay, that's all right. Uh, that's a majority. 
God wants to blow your socks off this year. And let me tell you, God blew my socks off. Because it says, um, Psalm 84 in the New King James Version, it gives the title, The Blessedness of Dwelling in the House of God, or other versions might say longing for the house of the Lord longing blessedness and then I read the little inscription it's got here and under every psalm it's got something different and this is dedicated to the chief musician on an instrument of gaff I thought that's interesting and it says there a psalm of the sons of Korah or Korah K-O-R-A-H Korah not Coronation Street now, nothing to do with them, but Cora, okay, Cora. I was thinking, I've heard about these before. So I always thought this was a psalm of David, because David often longed for the tabernacle, he longed for the presence of the Lord. I'm thinking, no, it's of the sons of Cora. And I was thinking, this is really important, it's not to be overlooked. So I did some digging, and basically the sons of Cora, a man named Cora was an ancestor now these are his children, his sons. So this is the next generation. A lot of generations down the line have written this beautiful psalm. But you've got to go back a bit and realise the transformation, what had already happened for them to write this psalm. You see, you've got to look in the text. You've got to look beyond the text. You've got to look through the text. All right? You've got to look at the context. And as you study your Bibles, you do Bible studies, you open those concordances and Hebrew lexicons and all these things and Strong's concordances, you suddenly be, your socks will be blown off. So the important thing here is, Korah was their ancestor. Korah died in rebellion against Moses in Numbers 16. There's a whole chapter in number 16. You don't have to go there now. Just make a mental note, write it down, get the teaching on YouTube, and you can listen back to it. Number 16. And basically, Korah rose up with some other, others and accused Moses and Aaron of setting themselves up, exalting themselves above God. It says, basically, Korah wanted to be the leader, so he decided to basically get everybody else to go against the leadership so he could be a leader okay so he challenged authority he challenged their authority when Korah rebelled against Moses who was Israel's God-given leader Korah was in fact rebelling against God because God had chosen Moses okay so there's a lesson here so him and 250 others he started you see this in politics don't you you see this is all gathered together to try and have a slime fight in it and they totally put one over down trying to poke that get them from oh and it's slimy and it's messy and it's horrible this is what he did he rebelled against god who had chosen moses as leader then a Mos- and then in, then number 16 verses 31 to 35 what happened was there was a what could be described as an earthquake the ground split open, swallowed up Korah while he was still alive, and his family, and his followers, and all of his goods. The ground opens up. They fall in. They go down to the abyss. And you can read this in number 16, 31 to 35. This actually happened. The ground swallowing up. They disappeared. Now, the other guy said, oh my gosh, lest we get swallowed up as well. Well, God then sent this fire, because they were presumptuous, and they died. And there was thousands and thousands and thousands of Israelites killed that day, which is really, really sad. Then, Numbers 26 is really interesting. Um, Because it says... Later on, down the generation, that the sons of Korah did not die. There was some good left in his line. So the second thing we see is a transformation of a generation. So here we see an invitation to transformation, but here we see a transformation of a generation. Even though Korah was wicked and they got swallowed up and completely gone, his ancestors 
still believed and his ancestors went did they did not die they were spared why because maybe god had a plan and purpose for the sons of korah he did so after seven generations of the korahites you get the prophet samuel and samuel was born got hannah's longing to god and there you go there you got the line i mean the importance of samuel but the the Korah is in that ancestral line in 1 Samuel 1, 1 to 20. Seven generations, again, the whole thing about perfection. And then later on, um, also, Psalm 84 talks about the sons of Korah becoming the gatekeepers and the doorkeepers of the temple. Okay? They were also um, great with choral music and instrumental music and orchestral music. They were used by David to, to prophesy, together with the sons of Ethan and Jonathan and uh, Asaph and all of them. So suddenly, these people whose beginnings were swallowed up. And now, I've written this beautiful psalm, and there's about 11 different psalms attributed to the sons of Korah. And these express gratitude, they express deep devotion to God. So they become key for King David as they gave thanksgiving unto the Lord with their music and the uh, orchestras and they prophesied to the cymbals and stuff like that. And they were also expert warriors, but most importantly, they were doorkeepers in the house of the Lord. People, prophets are saying 2024 is the year of the door. Well, God can take you from a person who was swallowed up to later on be a people who are now doorkeepers, who are very important people in the house of God. So we see this, even before you get into Psalm 84, just that title, the son of Korah, when you look at it, that is transformation. They were a generation that was transformed. You see, how much more can God do this for people who we think are way far away from God? who are way far, it didn't make sense, who are really far away, and those in our communities who are really, really bad and evil, who we perhaps think are not worthy, but Jesus calls them worthy, Jesus calls them friend, Jesus is the friend of sinners, and he's going to be working a lot with such people this year. We've got to be willing and waiting and wondering and loving and honouring because some people are about to get saved who have piercings in places where you'd never imagine who have tattoos in places where they never imagine you know they don't just smoke they're smoking smoke you know what I mean but that's the real people the real people the real young people but God's about to transform a generation so let's get into this. Okay. How lovely is your tabernacle, they say. Well, yeah, because he's, he, their dad, their ancestor, their granddad, well, they have disdain for the things of God. They have disdain. But how lovely are your tabernacles? O Lord of hosts, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. When you've been saved from your sin, from such evil, how much... To, to, to be in that place where you can say, oh God, you're amazing. You're just so long for God's presence. Because you know what you've been saved from. You know the mercy of the Lord that you didn't get what you deserved. Therefore, how much more are you longing for God that you want to be in his house? It says, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Our songs today were songs about... Here I am, crying out to you again, knowing that you hear every cry you are listening. No matter what state my heart is in, you are faithful to answer with words that are true and I hope that is real. As I feel your touch, you bring a freedom to all that's within. That's kind of a modern song of, modern psalm of longing. They write in verse 3 about the birds. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even the altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. 
Even the little birdies are precious in God's eyes. All are welcome in God's house. I read one commentary, they said, in the temple, in the tabernacle, even though there were sacrifices and stuff, if a swallow made a home by the altar in the house of the Lord, they let it stay. If God cares for the swallow and the sparrow, how much would he care for you? Isn't that what Jesus said? Isn't that what Jesus said? And it was the sons of Korah who put this idea there. Come on. How much more does he care for you? But here's where we want to go. Verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They shall be forever praising you. And remember now we're in the New Testament. We're a new covenant people. It's not about the buildings. Although buildings are useful. (laughs) God is building something even outside of the building. If you haven't seen the four walls poem prophetic thing. Go and read it. It's on my Facebook. I forgot to bring it. Though it's on the screen. But don't worry. The print's too small. God's going to do something outside the walls because Jesus himself is going to be the wall and the fire and the glory within. Okay, more on that next week. Stay tuned. Blessed are those. Verse 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Very, very interesting that word there for strength. He mentions strength three times in his psalm. That word strength is azaz. That means to be set To be fixed. Blessed are those who is fixed and set on God. These these sons of Korah were now fixed on God. They didn't wander like their ancestors anymore. They changed their history. Their history became his story. And God gets all the glory. God can change your history. God can change your track record. I'm sure if I did a race, I'd be the 99th. I won't even come 40th. Or 41st, whatever it was. 40th. Oh, I'm sorry. 40th. There's something about pilgrimage. Blessed is a man whose strength is in you, is fixed on you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. I love that word. When you think he's not here, Tony Porter, but he shared about his pilgrimage. He did not Portugal. He talked about his trials and the things he had to overcome. He talked about the heavy sack on his back. He talked about where he was feeling ill. He talked about where you know, there could have been distractions and shortcuts and how the Lord helped him to get through. How the Lord actually spoke to him about different things on his pilgrimage. But it's the same for us. We are on a pilgrimage together. Um, pilgrimage is a journey, it's a daily walk, it's about being set on God. This year, we are pilgrims. Oh, to be a pilgrim. It's a race. It's a walk, it's a journey. But the most interesting thing is this. The word pilgrimage in the Hebrew is mesila. It means steps. It means path. And it can be translated as in whose heart is the highway to heaven. In whose heart is the highway to heaven. That's what it is to have your heart set on God. And who's the highway to heaven? Jesus, because he's the way, right? (laughs) This is not some new religion. All paths lead to God. No, they don't. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Quote, end quote. That's the words of Jesus. He is the path. He is the narrow way. It's like John Bunyan wrote, wrote about the pilgrim's progress. The whole point is the pilgrim makes progress. progress. People are against progress. We see it as a political word, progress, oh no. But it's not, this is not progress, this is transformation. Transformation is completely different from progress. You can, you can measure progress, but to measure transformation is like completely different. It's, it will blow your socks off. Hey. Hey. 
So blessed is the man whose strength is in the Lord, who is fixed, who has set his uh, mind, who has set his life on pilgrimage, in, who, in whose heart is the highways of heaven. And it says this, and I love this, as they pass through the valley of Baca. So, as they pass through. The valley is never a place where you stay forever. It's a season of life. That's why Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Look at Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel 37. The Lord lifted me up and placed me down in a valley of dry bones. And the bones were very, very dry. And he said, can these bones live? Oh God, you know. Well, speak to them then. What? And he had to speak. Anyway, another sermon for another day. That was a valley. You see, you see valleys. But God has a habit of transforming the valleys. In the valleys you find Jesus. The harvest I preached about some of songs about the lily of the valley. Jesus is the lily of the valley. Lilies of the valleys only grow in the valley. Jesus is in your valley. Jesus will meet you in your valley. There's people around about who don't know God yet. They live on the Mount Estate. They live in Tish. They live in Harvard West. They live in Pembroke, Cardiff, Israel. It's a bright. Guildford Haven. Staten. Sort this thing out. I think I've got everybody, have I? I haven't missed anybody out. There are people there. Don't know God yet. And they think God don't care about them because they're in their valley. But in that valley, they can find Jesus. Because Jesus is in the valley. He's the lily in the valley. He's the rose of Sharon. You see, a valley's a thing you pass through. So my word for you today is, you're only passing through. What did Isaiah say? Said, Isaiah, when you go through the waters, you'll not be drowned. When you pass through the fire, you shall not be burned. Why? Because I am with you. You might smell a smoke. You might be wet, but it won't overcome you. How many men were there in the fire, in the furnace? How many went in? Oh, he blew their socks off. As they pass through, what they're passing through, a valley, and what was it, of Baca. I've done a lot of research about this. Scholars do not agree. <laughs> They don't agree. That's, that's why academia is what it is, because one has an argument and another one has an argument. And this is how they form their argument, and this is why, what, whatever. Somebody says Baca is a, a plant um, that only grows in arid places. I thought, that would work. I had that one. Um, it's also a valley in Palestine, literally. Um, they go through some stuff right now, Israel. Yes, yes, I'm just saying. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah Israel. And um, in that whole area, ge geographical area in the Middle East. And. Um, Oh, that's where you're going to find Jesus. That's his home. Israel's his home. The battle is over his home. The battle belongs to the Lord. They pass through the valley of Baca. Other translations will say it's a place of weeping, a place of trial. How many people do you know are in that valley of weeping, thinking they're on their own and nobody gives a care for them how many people they're not just going to turn up in chapel you know they're not going to miraculously well God can draw them like he did in the Welsh revival you have to go to them when they do come you've got to preach the gospel and hopefully they come to Jesus one step, but that's not the be all and end. You've got to then spend time with them and walk with them and disciple them and deliver them. And that's so often the shutters come down. Well, I come to Jesus, but I don't want to get involved in that church stuff. I don't want to get involved in other. I'm busy. I ain't got time. I ain't got time for religion. Well, religion ain't going to save you, but Jesus will. As they pass through the valley of Baca, weeping, they make it. I love that. You're going to make it. They make it a place of springs. They make it. I often think about that because people are walking with them. 
You're going to make it because you're not alone. You've got the church family around you. You're going to make it through the valley because God's going to bring his transformation. Other people are walking through the valley and they're going to be transformed because you're walking with them. And you build a relationship with them. You might not see the fruit first of all, but if you don't give up and keep on just being there for them, one day they will come through. One day they will come from that place of weeping. And they will be in that place of passing through, where suddenly everything is a spring. That word there also can mean a fountain or a well. Often think of, it's like when you've gone through an arid place and suddenly there's um, not a mirage, but there's an oasis where you go and drink from. It's a river of life where you can go and it's a support room for mums or it's a, 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 a sanctuary where people can go and meet Jesus when they've had some bad news or, or some discipleship group, river of life group or whatever it is. Suddenly there's a convergence. Suddenly there's a, a pool of blessing. They make it. And those tears, I often think this is, the weeping tears actually made it a pool. But every tear is a prayer and every tear is God sees it says in the Bible that he keeps the tears in his bottle God keeps a record of your tears did you know that God knows when you cry God knows when you mourn God knows all about you and he cares deeply and he remembers you they make it a spring they make it a well they make it a fountain then it says the rain also covers it with pools. The rain. We've had a lot of rain recently. The rain. I often think about the rain filling up the pools, like the, the stream which has been brown with the mud. It's the washing away of the dirt. It's the deposit. It's the overflowing. It's the running over. Suddenly, you're being washed through. The rain covers it with pools. With, with um, blessings and with pools. If you look at that Hebrew word for cover, in the Hebrew, it means to wrap oneself, to envelop, to fill, to wrap in, and to cover. And to cover with what? Pools. In the Hebrew, it is blessing, barak, ba'alkau. It means gift, blessing, generosity. And praise. You are covered in praise. You, you've gone through the valley of weeping. Now you're covered, wrapped in Jesus. You, you, you're wrapping yourself in the blessing of God, in the generosity of God, in the grace of God, even with the things we do not deserve from God because He loves you, because He paid the price. That's when you can overcome. And that's where you kind of come through into blessing. And that is where the transformation is. Today, get wrapped in God's covering. Get wrapped in God's blessing. Let it envelop you and walk in it. Then lastly, verse 7, we stop there. It mentions strength again. It says, they go from strength to strength until each one appears before God in Zion. And this is really, really interesting. Strength to strength. Two words in the Hebrew. Mekayil and kayil. It's the same word, but there's different verbs and nouns, different, um, um, different ways. Um, yeah, present tenses, that's the one. Um, to kind of, uh, to, to explain this. So, to go from strength to strength, from mechayil to kayil, means you're going from strength, physical strength, to um, efficiency, to wealth, to be in an army, to achieve military might and force. So it's not just strength to strength. It could be strength to wealth, wealth to blessing, blessing to an army, an army to a force, to might, to achieving. Because God's brought the transformation. You're going from strength to strength. Makayil to kayil. Strength to strength. We're an army. If we're an army, that means we're together. Which means we're no longer running on our own. We're an army. 
Don't miss that. Strength to strength. It's not singular anymore. What's the word? It's now more than one. Till each one appears before God in Zion. Then verse 10 talks about, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to spend a lot more years in the tents of the wicked. I'd rather be a doorkeeper, a gatekeeper. Imagine coming through all of that. You're out over the other side. You've learnt some keys on your journey. Your trial will reveal the keys. Your journey with God will give you keys to the kingdom. Like it says in the Gospels about the keys to the kingdom. I give you the keys to the kingdom. Will you become a gatekeeper? You become a doorkeeper. Not only to the house of the Lord, but actually so somebody else can receive the kingdom of God that that person will open the door of their heart that they can receive Jesus as their saviour. So this year, God wants to transform your valley, but also you're going to walk with others so their valley will be transformed too. God wants to bring you to that place of that enveloping blessing and strength where you're not on your own, yet you're walking together. Where you become doorkeepers with the keys of the kingdom in a New Testament sense. That others, because all about the others, will receive Jesus as their saviour. Amen.